Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I want to invite you to begin worshiping with us this morning by receiving the word of Jeremiah 10, 6 through 16. This is the word of God. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and God, you are our you are our almighty. There is no one like you. You are over all the nations, like a man stands over an anthill. Even though the might of all the nations of the earth might intimidate us, all the nations are like a drop from a bucket and like, and like dust on the scales to you. And all their gods, all the various gods of the nations, all the things that we've crafted to put our hope in are stupid and foolish. You are the true God and the true hope of people. It's by your wisdom and by your power that the sun shines and it never gets too close to incinerate us or too far away that we would freeze to death in the blackness of space. That order and that wonder is your daily work. When you speak your will, it is done. The waters rage or pour at your word. It's at your bidding that lightning strikes and thunder rolls and the wind blows. And at your word, hearts change. Lives turn. And they see in you their hope and their future and their joy and peace and life and forgiveness and strength and rest. Our Father, we will come to you again in a moment to ask from you and to plead with you and to seek help from you, but not now. Now we simply rest in the proclamation of your greatness. You are great. We praise you and we thank you and we confess together that you are God and there is no other and there is no king but Jesus Christ, crucified for sinners, raised and ruling at your right hand. And we pray this in the great name of Jesus and amen. Lord, we thank you for your kindness and grace to us in Jesus Christ. And that by him, our greatest wounds have been healed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you guys this morning to turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. We're going to keep on trucking through the Gospel of Matthew this morning. I'm going to read the text for you, and then I'm going to pray another prayer, asking specifically this time for the Lord to help us receive his word and have soft hearts and open eyes to what he has for us in it. So Matthew 16, I want to read from verses 21 to 28, and then say another brief prayer. You might remember the events from last week. Peter has this moment where he, 
Everything becomes clear to him. He confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew continues the story this way in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Pray with me one more time. Oh, Father and God, this is your word, and it is perfect. This is your testimony. It's sure. It's reliable. We are simple people, and we need your wisdom. All that you command us here and all that you point to in this passage is right. And it is joy to our hearts to hear you and see you speaking to us. All your commandments are pure, and they open our eyes to what life is really about and, and what we are here for. And, and to sit under it and to fear you and to care more about what you think than what, what people think, it's, that's the way to live. Because it's your word that endures forever. And it's your rules that are true. And it's, and it's all that you've spoken that's true righteousness. What we have here is more to be desired than gold sweeter than the sweetest thing we could imagine. By these things, we, we get warned. And by obeying these things, we get rewarded with more of yourself. But by subjecting ourselves to these things, we get alerted to the faults that we would hide even from our own hearts so that we wouldn't walk in darkness and walk in foolishness, but rather be warned about the sin of our hearts and, and turn from it and have fellowship with you and, and be innocent and and blameless. It's by this and only by your word that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts can be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. And we ask you now to open our eyes and free us of distractions as we sit under your good and perfect word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Christians, we have a real and true liberty to have a very simple faith. And I don't mean ignorant, anti-intellectual, thoughtless faith. I mean simple faith. I mean, some of the most intelligent men and inventors in history have been Christians. So I don't mean when I say simple faith, I don't mean dumbed down faith. I mean simple. I mean plain, straightforward. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, For I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's pretty simple. Sadly, in our day, even many pastors are not all that plain or clear about what that means. That our faith is about Jesus Christ and him crucified. I sat in a room full of pastors not many years ago and asked them, What did the crucifixion of Jesus accomplish? What did it do? I explained to them that I was teaching a class in the, coming, uh, in the coming weeks, and it was about that question, and I was curious what they thought, what view they held. I, I explained, you know, as far as I can tell here, there's actually a lot of different views about what the cross accomplished. I explained that, you know, I'm finding that some people say Jesus was crucified simply as an example of how we ought to live. That, that we, should, we should, like Jesus, love others so much that we'd be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for them. Of course, that's true. But is that what 
the crucifixion was all about. I ex- went on to explain with them that, you know, I'm finding others say that Jesus was crucified basically to make us so sad about our sins that we would turn from them and try to live a, a better life with, with Jesus on the cross as our inspiration. I shared a few more theories I'd come across, and then I asked them, what, what, what do you think? This is a room of seminarians and pastors. What did the crucifixion do? What was it for? And I heard crickets in a room full of pastors who get paid to talk for hours on end, seemingly about these things. And they had no answer. Now, I can account for some of the silence having to do with Midwestern niceness. Sometimes, uh, as Midwesterners, we smell a disagreement coming or a debate coming, and we shy away. That could have been what was going on in the room that day, the perception that the Baptist was ready to have a theological throwdown. But honestly, which I wasn't. I wasn't looking to fight. I just wanted to know what they thought. Honestly, I think mostly the reason for their silence was that they really, and many really, just are not clear on why it was necessary for Jesus to die. Did you you see how he says it in verse 21? It says that he began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. I looked this up in all kinds of different translations, and it's all there, this language of necessity. This had to happen. It was a it was a must. And I don't think we're living in a time that's always very clear on why it was a must, why it was necessary. And we're certainly not living in a time where everybody is clear on what it means to follow this crucified Savior. And we're certainly not always clear on why it is so important and urgent to follow Jesus today. But our passage in Matthew this morning speaks to all three of these issues, all three of these questions. And that's my outline for this morning. Uh, with the holiday being what it was, I did not, well, I, I got Mary all my, all my points, you know, for, um, did, which Mary, did you pull it off? Did, she, did you do it? Wow, okay, so we weren't sure you guys were going to have words on the screen this morning because I changed my outline at the last minute. And so, so everybody, you guys... Thank God for Mary today, if you like words on the screen. So that's our outline this morning. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? What does it look like to follow him? And why is it so important and urgent? And I'm going to try to weave my application points into, uh, into the body of the sermon rather than finishing with them. So question number one, why was it necessary for Jesus to die? The answer to this, plain and simple, and we'll we'll, we'll unpack it as we go, but it was necessary for Jesus to die so that he could bear our sins and take them away. See, immediately before this encounter here, the disciples, Peter in particular, have shown that they're really truly beginning to understand exactly who Jesus is. Peter says in 1616, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. While we know Peter certainly didn't understand everything about what he was saying, he didn't understand what he was saying to its fullest meaning, he did understand what was essential. Jesus was the very revelation of God. Jesus was the Savior that God promised from old. Jesus was Lord. And verse 21 says, from that time, from the time of Peter's confession, Jesus began to plainly show them even more of himself. He began to show them that the Christ that they had come to believe in would be a suffering servant. He would be a crucified Savior, that this would be necessary. It would be what must happen. And Peter's reaction to this teaching is apparent in verse 22. It's revolting to him. It's repulsive. Everything in him resists this teaching. And people haven't changed since Peter's day. Human wisdom is repulsed by this thought. We see this across the entire spectrum of human wisdom. Jewish and Islamic wisdom still do not accept that a supreme and holy God could rightly humiliate himself like this on a cross, the way Jesus did. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the very idea is scandalous to them. It's a scandal. They stumble over it. It keeps them from accepting the message of the gospel. 
This idea, how they, they, they question how could someone so holy and righteous subject his holiness and his purity to the evils of the cross, not to mention human flesh. Secular wisdom and liberal religion are also scandalized by the cross because they hate the idea that humanity would be bad enough to require such a costly sacrifice for our sins, if they even still believe in sins at all. I would also suggest that it's possible even for a Christian to be confused about the necessity of Jesus' death on the cross because they themselves don't like the idea that they might suffer in the same way that Jesus did. But Jesus' words about these kinds of wisdom are clear. To deny or dismiss the cross is satanic. Jesus' words to Peter, get behind me, Satan, are almost identical to Jesus' words for Satan himself back in Matthew 4 when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Satan tempts Jesus with the kingdoms of the world. He tells Jesus, you can have all the kingdoms that you came here for if you'll just worship me instead. You need not listen to your father. You need not go to the cross. I'll give it to you all now in exchange for worship. To which Jesus replies, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. In other words, get behind me. You're talking worldly things, and I want the things of God, no matter the cost, even if it costs the cross. Jesus essentially says to Peter, my suffering, my death, my resurrection is a thing of God. Peter didn't understand that right away, but one day he would. I invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll show you. While you're turning to 1 Peter 2, let me point out a bit about how Peter really exemplifies all the types of wisdom I mentioned a moment ago. When when Peter rebukes Jesus, of course, he exemplifies Jewish wisdom. He recognizes Jesus as Lord. As a side note, isn't it ironic that in the same sentence he calls Jesus Lord and rebukes him? Is that not humanity? Oh, Lord. Sit at my feet and I will tell you how things are are to go. But Jesus very or Peter very much with the Jewish mind, recognizing Jesus as Lord, recognizing Jesus' value and worth, and he doesn't see how Jesus could allow himself to be treated so worthlessly. This is a scandal to him, just like it was to any average Israelite. But Peter also exemplifies some secular wisdom as well because he doesn't see the necessity of Jesus' death. The word itself, rebuke, means to put due weight upon something. To put due weight upon something. In other words, when you see somebody tackle a subject or talk about something and you recognize they just don't quite get what they're talking about, and then you you take them aside and give them a rebuke, you give them one of those conversations that goes sort of of like this. Now, son... (laughs) Let me tell you how this actually works. (laughs) I'm going to put the due weight upon this subject because you're not, because you don't get it. That's what a rebuke is. To rebuke Jesus for teaching this is to assume that he doesn't have a handle, that Jesus doesn't have a handle on what's necessary, what must happen. So he's got some secular wisdom in his heart. And then I think Jesus really cuts to the heart of Peter's foundational problem with Jesus here. When he says this in verse 24, if you really want to follow me, you'll have to die too. You'll have to take up your cross. Within the hidden rooms of Peter's heart is a revulsion at Christ's suffering because it might mean that Peter has to suffer also. That's why Jesus goes on. Not to talk about the necessity of his own death, but the necessity of his disciples' death for his sake. Peter didn't understand this at first, but he would. I'm going to show you 1 Peter 2. Start up in verse 19. He says, This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. 
When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Peter would come to understand one day just what he wrote here in verse 24, that Jesus had to die because he had sins to bear, because people had sins to bear. And in the death of Jesus, he bore our sins on the cross so that our sins could be counted as punished and done and gone. Peter even quotes Isaiah 53 here, by his wounds you have been healed. Because it's Isaiah 53 that first pointed to this example of God's chosen servant being a sufferer in the place of sinners to take their sin away. My friends, if if you don't know this this morning, then I want you to hear this. This is why it was necessary for Jesus to die. Though it is repulsive to our natural wisdom, God's word is plain. God ought to punish your sins. That is what he should do. That is what would be right for him to do. But by his mercy and by his grace, he has sent and offered up his son in the place of sinners to bear that punishment in his body so that we, seeing the sufficiency of that punishment, could turn to him in faith and be forgiven totally and forever. What a great way to celebrate Independence Day this weekend than to turn your life over to Jesus, accepting that, yes, you really were bad enough to require a sacrifice that valuable, but that God and his love and his grace has gladly paid it so that you could be forgiven and turned in repentance and faith. I'm not going to leave today fast. I'm going to stick around. If you would like to do that today, give your life to Jesus, would you talk to me after the service so I can talk with you and pray with you? Or would you have that conversation with another Christian here that, that you trust? It was necessary that Jesus pay this price, and he paid it from the gladness of his heart. He has, with great emotion and commitment, swatted down every temptation that would have kept him from that cross where he took the place of sinners just like us. You see the fury with which he refutes this temptation. Peter comes to him and says, the cross need not happen. And Jesus, from the depths of his convictions and emotions and his heart, says, no, I will go and I will take the place of my people so that I can have them and my Father can have them and the worship he deserves. He denied every temptation that would have kept him from that great saving act in his death for sinners. And so if this is not a decision you've made for yourself, don't leave here today without making that decision. Talk to one of us, please. It was necessary. It was necessary that he take sins away. That's the first question the text answers. The next one is this. In verses 24 through 26, we learn what it looks like to be a follower of this Jesus. That's the second question the text answers. What does it look like to follow this Jesus, to follow a Savior like this, a crucified and resurrected Savior? The answer is in verse 24 and 25. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says to follow him, will mean that you will need to die also. He says, deny yourself and take up your cross so that you can actually live. Maybe you remember the way Peter said it back in 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that, why? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Following Jesus means dying to ourselves. Dying to the things of man, denying worldly things a place on the throne so that we might live for Christ, for the things of God. Live for the things that 
show the world Jesus is actually on the throne. In other words, following Jesus means dying so that you can live. Let's talk about the dying first. Christianity really embraces a counterintuitive reality. If you try to save your life by clinging to the things of the world, if you crown the world's pleasures as supreme, and if you try to live your life for them, you will lose your life. You will lose your life by chasing those things as supreme because they are not supreme and they cannot bear the weight of your soul. They are temporary, fragile, created things. They may not always be bad things, but they cannot satisfy you. C.S. Lewis once wrote, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were created for another world. The things of man cannot satisfy because we were created for another world. They can't fill our souls because this isn't our home yet. And so if we seek the filling up of our souls with man-made things and man-centered thinking, we will come to the end of our lives totally empty. We will have died trying to save our lives. Where does this hit you today? You probably know. Let me make a generalization. Consider Peter's own struggle here and how fundamentally it's the same as ours in America today. Peter cares, evidently, more about a pain-free life than he does the will of God. Peter would rather disobey than suffer. He assigns a higher value to the pain-free life than he does the will of the Lord. He wants the kingdom without the cost. Do we not see this today? Consider this. It has been statistically proven that just as many pro-life women will abort their babies as pro-choice women do if those babies are found to have so-called birth defects like Down syndrome or spina bifida. The statistics bear out that as soon as the baby has a so-called disadvantage, the distinction between pro-life and pro-choice goes away. Whether the mom is pro-life or pro-choice, the same percentage of babies are aborted when they're found to have these so-called defects. Why does that happen? It happens because the foundational faith position of our nation is the same as Peter's. Far be suffering from me. We cannot conceive of suffering being of God. We are like the disciples who saw the man born blind from birth and said, who's to blame for this, him or his parents? But Jesus says this man was not born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. He was born blind so that the works of God could be displayed in him. The foundational assumption of the world is that it is a high value to avoid suffering at any cost. But the foundational value in the kingdom of God is the glory of God in all things, especially suffering. What glorifies God more? You having more of the stuff that the world loves anyway? Or suffering the loss of all the stuff and still being able to say God is enough. He will carry me. And whether this kills me or not, I know he means to be my good Lord. At the risk of wearying you with Narnia references, I found a new one. In the silver chair, Jill and Eustace go to rescue Prince Rillian from an enchantment. And when, by the grace of Aslan, they rescue the prince, they are trying to escape from a wicked subterranean kingdom as it collapses around them. And as they go, a, a shield that print, the prince owned suddenly becomes emblazoned with the face of Aslan. And Rillian's interpretation of this miraculous event is this. He says, Surely this means that whether we live or die, Aslan intends to be our good Lord. Whether we live or die, Aslan intends to be our good Lord. Incidentally, Lewis gets this from the Apostle Paul who said, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 
And so we die to ourselves, and we die to our plans, and we die to our dreams, and we embrace suffering with this confidence that God will be our good Lord, and he will satisfy our souls, and he will do so with his goodness and with his glory forever and ever. And we say this because of the second mark of following Jesus. It does not only look like death to follow Jesus. It does not only look like dying to ourselves to follow Jesus. Following Jesus also looks like resurrection. We don't just die to self. We live for Christ. The Christian story is one where God always chases death with resurrection. Let me elaborate on what I mean. Of course, this is true in a literal sense. Because we have faith in Christ, when our bodies die, we are raised to newness of life to be with Christ forever. That is one part of what it means that we share in Christ's resurrection by faith. What it means to follow him is that you will rise in a body fit for fellowship with God forever and ever. But we also share in that resurrection now. Let me give you an example of where this is taught. Ephesians 1, 19, actually this is a run-on sentence as is typical with Paul. So if I start back up in 1, 16, so that I'm not reading a fragment, this is what it says. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering in you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, but that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And this is what I want us to see. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Well, what power is that, Paul? He goes on. It's the power according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly Places. Think about this. Paul says in verse 19, there is an immeasurably great power at work in believers and toward believers. And it is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We are alive to God today because by grace through faith in Christ, we have died to the power of sin so that our obedience could now be enabled, not by sweaty resolve, but by a new life that God has given us with this same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You are resurrected in Christ presently in a sense such that when sin comes to your doorstep and puts its weight on your heart you can say no no dead man alive to Christ dead to sin so the Christian life is an actual life Think about your everyday Christian walk. The death you've died to sin, it's not given to you so that you can spend the rest of your life in grim and dour abstinence from all the fun things. Christians are not to be the sort of folks who are always on the lookout, worried that someone, somewhere, might be having a good time. Many people hesitate to become Christians for this very reason. They hesitate to become Christians because they ask, what's going to be left for me to enjoy? What will I still be free to get away with? But Christians know this is the wrong question. The question is not, what will I be free to do if I become a Christian? The question is, who will I now be free to resemble? In Christ, the Christian life is given so that freedom can be had to grow up into the image of Jesus. The Christian life is a life of having traded pleasure for greater pleasure. It is a death to sin and self, scary though it is, only to discover that there is a greater pleasure on the other side of that death. So, so often what we fear when it comes to sacrifice and self-denial, we fear that there's no life on the other side of the sacrifice. We think things like, I don't know how I'd live without. Fill in the blank. But in Christ, God chases that death with resurrection. He gives life. Somewhere, one author pointed out that we are in the same position as that of a child who was told that marital intimacy is the highest bodily pleasure. He says, quote, I think our present outlook might, might be like that of a small boy 
who, on being told that marital intimacy was the highest bodily pleasure, should immediately ask whether you ate chocolates at the same time. On receiving the answer, no, he might regard the absence of chocolates as the chief characteristic of marital intimacy. And in vain, you would tell him that the reason why husbands and wives gladly set such pleasures aside is that they have something better to think of. But the boy knows chocolate. He does not know the positive thing that excludes it, and we are in the same position. Some of us hesitate to become Christians because all we can think about is what we're going to lose, and we cannot imagine what we will gain. But we are that ignorant boy who dismisses the reality of a higher pleasure because he can't imagine giving up a little one. We are trading pleasure for greater pleasure when we come to Christ where we die to lying in order to gain human approval and protect our reputation, we rise to find acceptance and approval in the reputation and performance of Christ in our place. Where we die to sexual immorality, we rise to being known and loved by God no matter our physical appearance or capacities. A God who knows and loves us and is faithful to us long past how appealing our bodies might appear to others. Where we die to anger, we rise to joy and gratitude. Where we die to obscene and cruel words, we rise to seeing others built up and encouraged and even changed because of the way we talk to them. Jesus has died and been raised so that by putting your faith in him, you could share in that. Not only so that your sins are forgiven, but also that you'd have the power to put sin to death and live for Jesus. Answering my invitation from earlier to talk with me about coming to Christ, about giving your life to Jesus would be a good thing to do. But understand that people will know you as a Christian not because you walked an aisle or prayed a prayer. They will know you as a Christian because they see you daily putting your sin to death and living for Jesus Christ. What do you need to die to today? Husbands, do you need to die to your pride and be the one to start apologizing to your wife first so that you can rise to a marriage where your wife can follow your lead because she sees your humility? Moms, do you need to die to your self-pity about how busy you are and rise to the gratitude of all, having all these tiny souls in your house that you get to shape for eternity? Students, do you need to die to being cool so that you can rise to fellowship with the God who made you and accepts you regardless of whether you fit the constantly changing definition of cool? Whatever it is, the reality of Christ's death on the cross for your forgiveness means there is life on the other side of whatever it is you need to die to today. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now, last question. Why is it so urgent to follow Jesus today? Why is it so urgent to follow Jesus today? This is answered in verses 27 and 28. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there is some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here's the answer. It is urgent that we follow Jesus today because he is the coming judge and he is the very present king. Verse 27 points to Jesus as the coming judge and 28 to the reality that as we read this today, he is enthroned as the king over all things. Let me unpack these verses, but do it in reverse order. We start with Jesus as king from verse 28. Skeptic, skeptics love verse 28, and they love all the verses just like it. They say, ah, oh, you see here, one more example of why we cannot trust Jesus or the New Testament you see, Jesus predicted his own final return within the lifetime of his own disciples. Did you see it? He predicted that his return would come to pass before many of the people that were standing in his presence even tasted death. And because he predicted his final return while many of those people were still alive, we need not pay Jesus much attention. The problem with that assumption is that in verse 28, Jesus isn't talking about the second coming. He's not talking about the final judgment in verse 28. He's talking about it in verse 27. That's apparent. But in verse 28, he's talking about something else. Verse 28 is actually talking about his ascension to the right hand of his father as the decisive victor over sin, Satan, and death. 
You see, the disciples, like all the Israelites at the time, thought that the arrival of God's kingdom on earth and the final judgment were one and the same event. One event. One coming. This is what John the Baptist thought. This is how they all imagined it. They didn't imagine the manger. They didn't imagine Nazareth. They didn't imagine the Savior being a carpenter. They didn't imagine that he would collect fishermen and tax collectors for his disciples. And they certainly didn't imagine the cross and the resurrection. They only conceived of one coming of the kingdom in final judgment and consummation. But here, Jesus alludes to these events playing out separately and differently than they imagined. Here's where we get this from. We get it from Daniel 7. When Jesus says things like he says in verse 28, and he'll say things like this again, he's referring to his coming, not from heaven to earth, but from earth to his Father. Because that's the picture of Daniel 7. Uh, the Son of Man was Jesus' favorite title for himself, and here is where Jesus gets the title. And this is what it says about the Son of Man. In verse 13 of chapter 7 in Daniel, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. Where did he come? Where, did he, where was he coming to? The text says, he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before the Ancient of Days. And there to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus will again reference this passage on the eve of his crucifixion. He will stand before the chief priests and Pharisees and he will tell them, I am that son of man that Daniel wrote about and you are going to be alive on the day when I come on those clouds and approach my father and receive from him the throne I deserve. We've already seen Paul allude to this in Ephesians 1 when I read it for us earlier that Jesus, having accomplished his mission on earth, then sat down at the right hand of his Father in the heavenly places to rule. Jesus tells his disciples, You're going to live to see that day. You're going to live to see me take that throne as the victor over sin and death, and you will know that on that day there is not one single thing in all creation over which I do not rule. As Abraham Kuyper famously said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. It is urgent that you follow Jesus today because he is king over all things. Sin, Satan, death. And he is the coming judge, as we read in verse 27. Death could not hold him, we sang earlier, which means it had no case against him. Death took him, but it had no charge by which it could hold him. And so he alone lives on the other side of death, fit to judge the world in righteousness. And so here's the point. Jesus is the coming judge and there is no shelter from his justice in any place in all creation except under his cross. And he is the king. There is no better life than the life lived under his crown. So the takeaway from this and how I will finish is to say this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we cannot let the possibility of suffering keep us from doing good go back to 1 Peter 2, I'm convinced that Peter must have had this encounter with Jesus in the back of his mind when he wrote 1 Peter 2, when he wrote that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. What I want to point out is that when Peter brings all that up in the first place, he's bringing it up because he's trying to help believers be able to suffer, especially suffer for doing good. He says, this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Brothers and sisters, we are well into an era where it is virtually impossible to have a civil disagreement about the subjects related to gender and marriage. As Christians who actually believe what the Bible says, it's getting increasingly more difficult to talk about your biblical convictions and not be labeled a bigot. We are in an era where it's going to feel increasingly futile to actually believe what the Bible teaches and share what the Bible teaches because those who oppose us do not argue rationally or justly. But we must be willing to carry our cross in this area. And we must not let unjust labels 
We must not let fear of mockery, we must not let fear of the cool keep us from enduring and laboring to tell the truth in love. Because on the other side of that sacrifice, there's resurrection, and there's life, there's fellowship with this Jesus who carried the cross for our sins and lives to bring people to himself. Let's pray. Father and God, we thank you for your kindness and grace in Jesus who bore the cross for our sins and took them away for good. That there's not an ounce, not a drop, nothing left of any kind of punishment that you have held back. It's all poured out on Christ. And so in Christ and under Christ at the cross is freedom and forgiveness forever and ever. And I pray that those here who have not yet tasted it would taste it today. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I want to invite you uh, today as we, as we part to continue your worship by uh, giving. Uh, if you're a guest and a visitor here, we don't expect or uh, uh, suppose that um, you, know, you, you, know, you need to give. Uh, you are a guest. We're happy you're here. Uh, but if uh, Discovery is your home church, uh, we invite you to continue worshiping uh, by giving. There's some baskets located near the, uh, there's a t table back there where there's a basket. I think there's a basket out that way as you exit as well. So just as a part of giving, right, I'd say it's right here. <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, we, part of our routine as a family has been to go to the park and have lunch and invite you to come and fellowship with us. We're going to take a break from that this week and, Lord willing, start it up again next week. So if you go to the park, well, the park's open. You can go to the park if you want to. Uh, it just the kitchens are taking a break this week from that. So with that, I want to send you out with a good word from 1 Timothy 1.17. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. You are dismissed.